Thank you. Welcome, Joe. Thanks. Um, thanks, Andrew, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I'd just like to say, to begin with, actually, I'm, my stomach isn't feeling too great tonight, so I hope my brain is functioning better than my stomach. Uh, but it should all be fine. Um, I've, before I do these things, I, I never know exactly what slides to pull to show. And I'm always surprised what I've left out when I arrive at, uh, at, at the slides. What I've tried to do to, tonight, actually, is uh, concentrate a little bit on what's been going on in the past year, but also bringing in works that, that date actually right back to 1988, which um, have led to a lot of the changes that have happened in the work, because uh, the work for me tends to uh, um, change quite drastically, sometimes due to where I'm working, but generally speaking just due to change of material. Um, the, the slides will, in, will include some of my, my studios. My, the history, of, like potted history, is that I come from Cork in the south of Ireland, studied in Leicester Polytechnic in th three-dimensional design, which I never used, and I left, went to California and did an MA in printmaking, which I never used, and then I came back. I stayed in America for a little while and came back to Ireland in 1983, and I've been working there mainly since, since then. So um, I'll just fire away with the slides because I have quite a lot of them. And uh, please do interrupt as I go along if you feel like it and ask questions as I'm going through them. Because I actually find it a relief sometimes myself because one can get tied into different emphasis and different aspects of each piece of work in quite a trying way. And the, the trouble, I think, with slideshows by any artist is we have our little rap and um, it, it's nice to hear other, other people's kind of, um, in, you know, ideas or whatever or questions. So please do shout and feel free to ask anything. Um, also, when, when Andrew invited me to do this, um, one situation that does arise for, for most women of my generation uh, that work uh, uh, in areas that have anything to do with sexuality is that you do get labeled as uh, an artist working in gender. And it's something that I find increasingly tedious. Even though, of course, every piece of work can be read in, in those terms, it is not all about that, and it is not my you know, overpowering concern to be an artist around that issue. So I begin with this slide, which is um, um, a computer um, photograph of an adult lateral skull x-ray and a fetal uh, x-ray of a baby. And it was for a project in a hospital in Dublin, which uh, actually refused the piece in the end. And at the time, I realized that the, the fetal position in the womb is very similar to the, the, the brain position in the head. And for me, actually, this piece was in some ways a revelation around that notion of procreativity and death and in some ways gender because the adult skull is genderless. Um, in this situation it's impossible apparently to tell what gender it is. But the death thing, um, which is probably common to most people's work anyway, is something that actually was a very, very important um, um, element in the work from the very early days. And when I finished doing printmaking and came back to Ireland, not having studied there, I was kind of isolated in a, in a basement flat, making kind of cardboard boxes and things. And um, my parents had moved into a little house and I acquired a lot of their, their, their possessions that I had connections with that they didn't really particularly have much value uh, for. So this was a little bath that um, uh, was in our house by the sea, which only measures about four feet. And we all, including my father, had baths and it's like he had his knees up to his chin. So all these things were delivered to my basement flat. And, um, I started making these plywood structures, and this piece was shown in 1988 in, in Dublin. And it was very obviously, I thought at the time, about this death element, the shark, cutting through a surface, the surface of a wooden kind of top to this little bathtub. Then you had this nine foot tall tower with little holes with nipples sticking through. Again, the nipples could be genderless, and it was very much about the, our, the common predicament sitting in your little bathtub, you know, waiting for this kind of buzzsaw shark to cut through and end up in collapse. But it was read so drastically and radically as male threat uh, that it really actually quite upset me. And, um, uh, and I was amazed. It, it, well, the, you know, you, you got the reaction from men actually very often was uh, castration, but from women it was like this awful, threatening, nasty male shark. So um, it 
set the ball rolling for a series that actually was trying to um, confuse that, that notion. Uh, it was very simply made out of very cheap um, uh, pine that was sliced into thin slivers. Very crafted in those days. Took a, lot, a long time to, to make. Um, this is a swimming pool I swam in when I was very young. I swam a lot. Um, uh, and in Cork, we had these two swimming pools in the whole city. And they were left empty while I was away. And I got access to them when I came back and actually wanted to make an exhibition for this space. And they had been empty for seven years and full of like slimy water, but terribly beautiful kind of um, corporation swimming pools. Um, they didn't give me permission. But very soon after, I got an invitation uh, from a gallery in Dublin called the Douglas Hyde Gallery, which is in Trinity College, which, funnily enough, you enter from above and you have this quite nice feeling of entering a swimming pool because it's this um, well of space that you, you come into from above. So this became the kind of arena for the first notion for the swimming pool. And there you can see the bath piece. And then in the middle of the floor, it was this kind of arrangement of couples. And this was very definitely um, kind of a toy town kind of ridiculous set of, of couples, um, some that were obviously connected and some not so obviously connected. And you could walk down that ramp from the bottom of the stairs to actually meet them. And there was this awful brown carpet on the floor, which we all, all us artists had tried to get rid of. And then Kiefer came to Ireland and had a show there and said, please get rid of the carpet. And they, they did it like that. But at the time, we had to fight incredibly with this disgusting carpet. And this piece was... Um, called Shark Lady in a Ball Dress. And she was the reaction to the, the bath piece. Is she in focus here? She's, about, she's small. She's only about three or four feet tall. And I, wa I wanted to make a girl shark. It was as, as simple as that. So she has little breasts, and she's a dorsal fin and two pectoral fins. And the, you know, the obvious dress and breasts. And here we have a shark. But all, also, you know, kind of inadvertently, you, you have the direct uh, phallic shape on top, which a lot of the critics wrote about as a penis in a dress without kind of um, zoning in on the fact that she was meant to be a shark, which kind of fed back into the first notion again, you know? Just bronze with woven bronze dress. Then I, I went to New York for a short period to PS1, uh, which is um, a studio program that countries send. You can go for a six-month period. And I was still working with the sharks, but it was more identifying the most dangerous. And there are 30 species that are known to have attacked man supposedly without provocation. And they range from a white-tipped reef, which is only about three feet long at maximum length, to the great white, which we all know, kind of 21, 22 feet long. And the, this was a little causeway made out of sharks cut out to scale up to this image of a solar eclipse. And then this kind of coupled bed in the middle that was um, a bridged white form over a kind of a, quite a formal chaise long sh shape. But th this kind of phallic thing that protruded through the hole is a test tube full of fossilized shark's teeth. So it's more about, uh, in, in that piece, I think, that kind of the history of that violence uh, and the memory of it. But um, it's quite a pleasant object now because it's this nice, smooth um, test tube. So it's not, it's more about the memory of possible pain or death or, you know, oncoming death, really. Because um, I, I was quite keen to try and um, break, uh, separate, um, uh, I didn't, w and I'll talk about this more with the cows others later on. It, 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 it's, I was trying, I think, at that point even too, without knowing it, to try and confuse the territories by presenting something that's blatantly, obviously, you know, in everybody's psyche, dangerous, a shark, but also has an underbelly of kind of, seduction and um, uh, sits very much in most people's kind of um, unconscious. Oh, sorry. And at that point I came back to Ireland and um, I was studioless and uh, a friend of mine told me that there was this power station in the middle of Dublin Bay which I could rent for a few months. And it was built in 1903 and um, uh, closed down in 1973. And the, 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 the chimneys, uh, the two chimneys are connected to a modern um, power station, but this big brick building in front is um, where, where I was allowed kind of free reign. And um, I ended up working there for four years, and that led to a whole series of work that was just about scavenging, really. No, no, I actually legally only rented 400 square feet. 
but didn't tell them that, you know, I was using the whole thing. And it was quite funny at the time that um, uh, I, you know, I found, I'll show you shots of the inside, I found things like the control room and the scientific labs and the locker rooms. And I kind of felt like it was my territory, really, and I used to get really annoyed if I ever felt anyone had been in there, because kids used to come in and draw graffiti and catch the pigeons uh, for pigeon racing. Um, so it really, it, it was a very silent place with only me wandering around. And I thought I'd better ask them, could I take the stuff? But they um, then said, how do you know it's there? And then there was this awful kind of legal thing, oh, you can't go in there because you, you sue, a, sue us if you fall down a hole. So am I pushing the right button here? Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry, wrong one. Um, but in the end, then, funny, they came back to me a few weeks later and said, well, you can take them if you want to, and I had taken them at that stage anyway. But this was the big boiler house. I didn't actually physically work in that one, but I had a pump house on the other side. But it's actually, it's, 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 I went into Millbank bank in the Tate there recently when they were showing it when it was gutted. It had very, very similar structures, you know, and I, like going into Millbank, I was thinking, why didn't they let artists in there to make things now? You know, they had one artist, but he was, o he was only given the staircases and things. You know, it would have been so fantastic to allow incredible messes to be made, you know, at this point in time, in it's such an incredible volume of space. I won't even talk about this piece, it's just uh, another shark thing. Um, this was one of the first things I started making when I was down there. It was called Passion Bed, and it was twisted from wire. And these little glasses were kind of piss-colored Mexican cheap glasses that were suspended in the network of wire. And each one had one of the 30 species of shark sandblasted onto them. And it, was, it, it took a very long time to twist. And it, it, it was very, if you lay on it, you know, it would collapse in five seconds. So it was, and the glasses were blasted through. Here you can see the little white-tipped reef and some have holes right through. So it was almost like, you know, past passion or spent passion um, or intoxication or whatever, but also the inherent kind of danger that, that, that's in there. This is the control room, which is the, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my, in my life. It, I walked into it, and at certain times of the day, the sun comes through these holes where gauges were removed, and it's like Solaris or something. You know, it was just like this extraordinarily beautiful place. And all the glass had been broken in the, in the roof by vandals. And so the whole floor glittered. It was just incredibly beautiful. So we, we uh, myself and some students, took the surface. Uh, actually, at the time, I was invited to do a show in Philadelphia ICA. And I brought uh, the director down here. And I said, wouldn't it be great to bring the whole um, control panel? And again, it, Kiefer came to mind because he probably would have. But we took six off the top and then kind of re tried to recreate it in the white space of the Philadelphia ICA, which, you know, wasn't as beautiful as, as that, but worked to a certain extent. This was the surface covered in dust. When you lit it from underneath, you had this amazing thing that the language that was used was so emotive. Start, raise, lower, error, danger. Um, exciter, there was this machine called an exciter, which actually titillated the um, turbines into functioning when the energy levels were dropping. And I, I, I used to go into the, the, the modern um, powerhouse next door sometimes, and it was all digital and neutral and nothing uh, emotive about it whatsoever. Oh, well, oh sorry. <laughs> Actually, I was doing it from my memory. Let's see. Let's see if I can even read it. Uh, actually, this might even be... Um, that's danger, error, lower, stop, start. Not sure. A bit out of focus. But the, the, my favorite one actually is coming up, which is... Um, I'll show you next. This was actually how it looked when I first came in. And I, I met some old men who used to work there, and um, th nobody was allowed in that room. The, 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 the main control man and like two or three substitutes and one or two high-powered technicians ever walked in that room. All the others ran around the edge on the outside, and it was curved. It was, it was, very, very, it was built actually by the Siemens, Ger the Germans, and they stayed on actually as uh, technicians in the factory. Um, and actually, apparently, I heard a great story that when, when voting was happening in Germany, they, a, a submarine came into Dublin Bay and they actually went out and voted on the submarine and then came back in you know, to work. This was the recreation for, for, for um, Philadelphia with many more pieces that I actually won't talk about too much right now. I'll be here all night. Th this was a pair of beds called slicer beds and they were, um, the, the whole idea of the powerhouse show actually was trying to bring together domestic and industrial 
because it was like I was moving in this kind of forgotten territory and I had some kind of license to be intimate with it. Um, and, you know, I was finding socks and shoes and Guinness bottles and uh, memorabilia of the men that worked there. And obviously it was only, only men that did, had worked there. So these were, were a pair that looked ostensibly as if they had once been a single bed but were separated into being a double bed. But they're made out of these laser cut slices of steel. And in the tummy of the beds, this is what it said on the gauge. So beautifully set out, you know, um, just, you know, so modern and fantastic. And like, who would have thought of some deep excitation? You know, now they, you, you would never find it. I just was totally um, happy when I, when I found those. Um, this was a piece that was a major kind of structure in the, um, in the space. It's a very tall space. It's about 30 feet tall, and then you have a well that drops down in, in the ICA. And this piece I referred to as Parthenon from the very beginning, and for, for any architects that are here, it might have seen it immediately, but I had it in my studio, and I always make things that I can move them myself because I can't afford technicians all the time, and you, know, you only have so much body strength. So I would cut these up into sets of three lockers, and then I'd be able to manipulate them. So little by little, it started looking like this edifice, but it was made up of these slimy, dirty, filthy um, workmen's lockers. And inside the doors, uh, this is the internal chamber. I made, uh, kind of reconstructed like a bathroom and through gauges that I'd found broken on the floor and bits of old gloves and things. And this was a bed that kind of had this phallocentric wire structure in the middle. Um, that was like, all this stuff was very much about, you know, is something regenerating or is it kind of mel melting into memory? Like, you were never sure. You'd, walk, you'd find these areas in the place and it felt like if you pushed a button, you know, they'd ignite. Um, and this was on the back of the doors of the locker. Hitler and Goering and Lord Ho Ho and this kind of uh, eradication of whatever notes were being made by the boyo in his locker. And this element of power was on, on one side, and, and then you had um, the other type of power that one is kind of thrown into in Ireland from a very early age, Mater Dolorosa. And there was, no, there was actually no sex uh, but the, uh, on the walls, but the old fellow that used to come and chat to me told me that they probably took it with them when they moved next door. I, I had got cold chills when I found Hitler first. Um, partly because I think, I remember at quite an early age hearing that my father was going to row to England to sign up in the war. But he had asthma and he wasn't allowed. But then, um, then being quite ashamed of being at a dinner party when um, all these English people said, of course, all the Irish were pro-Hitler. So I was kind of going, Jesus, what is this, you know? But then the more I kind of researched it, the more I discovered that there were Germans there, so I blamed them, you know? So it could have been Irish support for Hitler, I actually don't know. But in Dublin, uh, I've got to be here all night if I tell these stories, but there is this amazing house in Dublin, which is in quite a fancy neighborhood. And it's, it's two old men have been living there for the past, since I moved there like 15 years ago, and it's called Spandau. And they do these art things all over the house, and they tie little bunches of roses and pictures of Alsatian dogs, and little cans with nails sticking out of them. And it's this ex extraordinary uh, installation. And I'm convinced they were Nazis, but nobody knows, and they paint the bottom of their windows silver. You know, incredible stuff. So th there is this kind of thing in Ireland that obviously a lot of Germans did come there when the war ended, and so it's kind of a shady area, you know. But my, I was shocked when I first found them. But I did find some beautiful battleships and things as well, and airplanes that were very kind of little boyish, you know. But this piece then was a, a counterpoint to the, par the Parthenon, and which is just called Screen Ladies' Changing Room. And it was a screen painted by the men in nice kind of, I, I call it architectural green, actually, with that kind of trendy color in the 80s. And behind you have this row of uh, hard hats cast in bronze that have these nipples on the tip. So it's like a peep show. You come, you peep through the holes. And holes also, you know, you could talk about holes for hours too. Holes uh, kind of come up a lot in, in a lot of my work, but um, without realizing it um, until kind of recently. But the hats, this was about the only object, actually, that I f physically made from start to finish in the show. I, t I found a plastic one, cast it in wax, then cast these nipples, and you could actually wear them. And um, they would protect you, but they were rather heavy. But um, from thr through the holes, you, you, all you saw were breath. Um, after that show in Philadelphia, a man in Dublin um, had a site-specific show in this very beautiful jail uh, called Kilmainham Jail, which is right next to the new Museum of Modern Art. 
and it's kind of one of our kind of uh, important political buildings in Dublin because it's where in 1916 when the rising happened um, a lot of our heroes were shot in this jail and then it became a um, museum and so we were offered all these little cells to make a piece of work in and um, which was actually a very good idea that we weren't anywhere in the foyer or out in that beautiful kind of panoptic space it became very personally a cell um, and I, at the time I was um, I can't remember where I was but the first image I had was a pig because you know, in London Illustrated and all that stuff that lampooning cartooning uh, about the Irish especially post rising was very much uh, around the pig and we were depicted uh, as pigs so I thought I would like to again uh, you know confuse the issue a little bit here and my first suggestion was to get a pig and put him in the, in the cell for the period of time with the door closed and have, it, have him live there so I found a, a little pig factory in the middle of Dublin in this tiny little street actually that looked like normal cottages and it has something like 75 pigs in the backyard and this was their favorite pig he's called Chester and I rented him he <laughs> cost 60 pounds for the day and a farmer I know in County Wicklow told me I could have bought the whole pig for 60 pounds but they, they brought him up and they put him, we put him in the cell and he totally loved it. I think he was delighted to be away from the 74 other pigs. And like, we put a green light and then I photographed him through the people. And it was very sad because he didn't want to leave actually and he screamed and uh, was probably made into sausages very soon afterwards. But the idea of this piece was that you, the, the curator said, no, you can't have a pig in there. It'll smell and it'll upset all the other artists. So um, <laughs> I wasn't allowed and Chester went home. So we, I photographed it and then instead, it, it was a shift on, which it probably was better actually in the end of the day. So the cell door is open and you walk in and there's a little manger on the floor and actually the, the um, prisoners used to sleep on straw on the floor. And in the middle of the manger is a little pig, a baby pig. And on the wall I made a calendar of the photographs of Chester through the people. So it was like evidence of the adult pig, whether it was the mummy or the daddy, in the cell before the baby arrived. So it was like a nativity scene in a, in a strange way. And again, like the death thing, like, you know, I do use a lot of dead animals, and it's not kind of intentional, but it has been kind of continuous. And I think it's more identification with the animal than anything else, you know, that um, there's not much difference. Um, and this, these pigs came from the same source as all the snakes that I now have in Fritz Street. It's a scientific suppliers in Carolina and America. And it's, um, I thought it would be tiny, I thought it would be about three inches wide, it arrived, it was like the size of a roast beef, it was like 16 inches long, and its little tongue was hanging out. And the idea of this was very much about, like, you, the, the very, very important was that you weren't sure whether the pig was alive or dead. And one problem we had um, logistically with the, was that they started drying out, and then you knew they were dead, they started looking like rashers. Whereas in the beginning, it looked like they'd popped, just popped out of the mummy pig. And that's when it was vulnerable, and that's when you had to look very close. And is it about kind of, you know, the rebirth of the pig? And anyway, now, whoever was in the cell is free. So what role does that ex-prisoner now function as? And in some senses, you can read a lot of the actions that are still going on today as, you know, as, you know, pig-headed or, you know, awful things. But is it the prisoner or the imprisoned? Uh, you know, the, the, prison, the person who imprisons or the, the prisoner that is actually the pig? Um, and that's what I, I suppose I was trying to do with that. Then I, I went to Norway for, uh, for that's a, probably a very bad slide, but I, I put it in because it, it, it kind of shows the source of the others, which uh, maybe people have seen most of my work in this country. It's, um, I went to Norway, I was invited to do a public project up in, way up in Nordland. It's a, a very beautiful province just that cuts the Arctic Circle. And they're very amazing people, they're very economical, they go out fishing, this stunning landscape. I was absolutely kind of terrified at the prospect of doing anything permanent and I don't actually think I'm even going to show you the piece here. But I did find uh, this sieve made out of another in a little folk museum, you know, the way they recreated the fishing house and all the little bits and bobs. And I just fe fell in love with it, thought it was so beautiful. And the, you know, it had been fixed even, there's a little stitched patch and such care and attention and kind of utilitarian and, you know, Merritt Oppenheim and all that just flooding in, fantastic. And also just the old cow who, what I certainly had never considered the cow in any way other than being an old milk bag. So then I came back to Ireland and tried to locate some taxidermists who might supply me with some cow skins. Oh, actually, there were only three in the whole of Dublin, and this one particular guy was great. He would go to the abattoir, he would bring me back the skins. 
Um, they, would be ca they would be wet, not bloodied. Um, but the cows had died from old age or sickness, so um, they w some of them weren't very beautiful, you know. They were baldy and warty and kind of old. And this piece really was the kind of pivot of the cows. She um, was called Amazon. And I actually, when, when the skins arrived, they, he's, he ripped me off royally in the beginning. He once he charged me 400 pounds for a cow, and the next, I got to know him, and then they got cheaper. But each skin was 100 pounds, and this, this skin arrived with only one teat, and I was going, oh no, it's only got one teat, and it cost so much money, and you know, I was going to phone him up and tell him to you know, give me another skin. And a friend of mine was there and said, just look at the size of the teat, you know, and it was an exceptionally <laughs> enormous teat. So um, it was kind of a happy accident because I had this tailor's dummy like lying around as more so in the past I was more like that keeping stuff around. But it, they worked their, their way into pieces a lot. But here you have this headless structure, uh, kind of Victorian shape, and I built out the, the, the breast area with a, with a ball and then pinned the skin around. And what was, again, you know, what some... Some people always, you know, you know, the way the mercenary people say, why don't you make 10 of them and sell them or whatever. You could never, ever, the cow skins were so different, you could never, ever repeat them. And even the veins in this, you know, around the teeth, and they do age, and like all of us, and get dry and um, a little bit shriveled. Uh, but the, I photographed her, actually, when she was still quite young. And um, th th what, what happened with this particular piece was it actually summed up all the other cow pieces in that, you had this singular teeth which could still supposedly function as a milk giving breast, so it was not denying the breast, but it also was like the head of a penis, so but completely because of the, the way the skin um, kind of settles back into the mound. But the thing about the, the cows, uh, you know, that I always found, like the fact that they were so dead, they'd come into my studio and, uh, you, you know, you'd have the feeling of these docile things in the field, and I was very aware that I was dealing with these dead things. But it was kind of like some kind of, um, I suppose, in a funny way, a kind of reincarnation for the cow. And um, like another chance, you know? I, I don't know. I, um, I, I did have whaps of sadness for the cows at, at times, but uh, I think they ended up better kind of breeds through, the, through these things. Um, this piece um, was called Virgin Shroud, and it was, well, it actually, I, it happened around the same time as the Amazon, and it, it was probably one of the earliest ideas in terms of the teeth, and um, I had been reading a lot about, you know, motherhood and um, how the breast obliterates, and uh, I remember Marina Warner's book on um, Alone of All Her Sex, The Cult of the Virgin Mary, there's an awful lot of talk about um, the brain and the breast and how one becomes more emphatic than the other through motherhood. So I wanted also, the, uh, originally I was going to actually put this on a, a statue of the Virgin Mary and I thought that was too obviously kind of Irish and kind of um, ridiculous. So I made this structure that's about seven feet tall and the teeth are on the head and they're meant to read like, like a crown. But also they're kind of overemphasizing or kind of overpowering the brain. And then it was a particularly kind of old, uh, torn skin. And I had, my grandmother um, was this great woman who, was, took to the bed very uh, early on and uh, sat there for about 20 years before she died. And would, um, you'd go and see her and she would kind of say, oh, take my wedding veil and make a blouse out of it. And she had given me that, that train, which actually came from her wedding dress in 1914. She gave it to me when I was about 12 or 13, when I used to make clothes. And um, I, I ju it just needed something beautiful to counterpoint the skin to, to try and draw the thing together. And it's called Virgin Shroud, very much about the potential of virginity and the shrouding of some kind of death. Um, the, the, the titling thing too, you know, you could talk all night about titling, but um, I've kind of stopped using titling these days because I think because I live in Ireland and everybody's so in love with the word. I just threw this in, it's not a great shot, but I thought it was quite beautiful, very Louise Bourgeois and very Virgin Shroud. It's from a, a Russian icon. So blatant, amazing. Then um, I was invited by the Fifth Street Gallery to do a piece in their new long room in, in, in downstairs, which is such beautiful proportions. And I, I always feel it's very, it's so fabulous to be invited particularly to do something for a space. And I usually am quite conscious of, you know, my relationship to the country. Um, and I suppose don't approve of just going and dumping myself anywhere without considering the location. Um, and uh, I, I was playing, I had made these single balls with little teeth, and um, 
I kept thinking sports, but what sport could it fit into? And then croquet came to mind because there are four balls in croquet. And um, this is the four babies are participating in the game, but the mother ball is kind of watching from the end. And it fitted perfectly in the gallery. But the, the, the thing about this um, was that um, croquet actually or originated in France and then traveled through the kind of aristocracy in Ireland and then ended up in England, where it became such an afternoon tea sport and part of kind of uh, the identity, I suppose, here. Um, but it was meant to be about foolishness. Like the mother, I, I, you know, I talk about this stuff and people I think probably think I'm mad, but you know, it is about the mother and her little brood. Again, it's, it's like if it's progressive, it's gone from having four teeth to one teeth, uh, where the one teeth is phallic and it's also a teeth. But uh, like, why are they participating in such a ridiculous game? And if you did hit them with the uh, mallet, they bounce totally erratically because of their teeth. So it would be more progress if they would no teeth at all. Well, they'd be able to play croquet anyway, but um, they wouldn't be part of the duo. This piece is called Point of the Finger. It was a part of a three-piece uh, three zebrachrome, and it's a finger stall. I always get the word wrong. It's called finger stool. But the, um, where, when you hurt your finger in the old days, you had leather ones that you put over bandages. And it's just single cow's teeth. And really, it, it was very much about how I make those things. You know, I was always inside, stuffing them with muslin and powder and things. And uh, it was about, I suppose, a 13 piece. This was a piece I showed in the States, and <coughs> it included a screen that belonged to the same grandmother. And uh, all the people are pointing their fingers at each other. And it's apparently based on some German folk tale where these people go through the town on a donkey and they all point their finger and say, you should have your father on the donkey. Then they both get on the donkey and they point the finger. It's all about accusing. So the screen was backed onto, it, was, it, it had this kind of fungal udder hanging in a, in, a, in a corner. And it backed onto this line of bricks that measured like 10 foot by 8 foot by 10 foot. And it, it was enough bricks to actually build a little house. Um, and this, this whole show, which was this, this photographed here in PPOW in New York, it was very much kind of like, I, I wanted the feeling that it was like a storage unit uh, in some way, that um, it, everything was placed in the middle of the room and that you, know, you could probably kind of rebuild it somewhere and make a home that would be quite livable in. But I think what I do with my belongings is take them and put them into this situation uh, because I'm not at ease with the type of home that I feel they, they represent. This piece is in, in Fritz Street at the moment, and it'll spoil your surprise if you've seen it here probably. But it's the last cow, um, and I had never placed a teeth genitally ever, 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 and had no intention of doing so because I thought what was interesting was the nipple penal kind of com uh, confusion. But this is an old trunk I found on the power station, and when you come up close, in a, it's quite gloomy when it's shown, and this, this is giving too much information on slides, but it's a kind of an important end to the cows. Um, it's a pair of old cotton knickers, and there's a, a cow's teeth stitched into the gusset. Um, and actually, in the catalogue that Arnold Feeney brought out for, for the works that are now in, in Fritz Street, there, there's a quite a nice piece of writing about it. But um, it's obviously got multiple kind of interpretations. Well, as pretty much straight up. <laughs> you know, I, I throw the... Oh, so God, very definitely on the inside. Oh, yes, Cathy. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. That, good question, actually. Actually, yeah. Could you, re could you read it? Actually, that could be a mistake. People could read that it would be actually a protuberance on the outside. Um, no, it's very much like it's an internal. And like at the time when I made it, you know, I, I talked to a few friends and I can't show this is so creepy and weird. And one person said, "Oh well, you can find things like this in sex shops in New York all the time. The self-pleasuring rubber ones." And I was kind of saying, "Not with the cow's teeth." But no, it's very, it's very much about the teeth becoming the penis as a as a as a, pl as a pleasuring element, or as a dildo, or as whatever. But you you, you do get an awful lot of dirty knickers, menstruation, all that. And the way you find it, I think, is quite important, so that you're not too sure whether it's been put away for further use or whether it's been thrown away with disgust. That it's about this strange kind of um, realm. And the way we show it, particularly in Foot Street, is very much in that kind of hidden corner, you know. But actually, it's something I hadn't thought about. I think the way they're thrown, normally, you can read it. Most people know how knickers lie, you know, that you can read that it's internal. 
Uh, I hope so, anyway. Mm. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, and the reactions have been quite, kind of really funny. Um, people screaming and kind of screeching with horror as if they've seen a spider to um, roaring laughing. And my, uh, an old friend of my mother's who's 85 stuck her head and stayed there quite a long time and came up and said, that's life anyway, when she walked <laughs> up. You know, <laughs> it was totally brilliant. That's what it kind of makes it worthwhile, I suppose. Um, back to more holes or apertures. Here's a, a, a family Bible that belonged to my mother, but we didn't actually come from a very Bible-based fa family. But it was some aunt or something, and it was up in the attic. And I asked her where it was and brought it to the studio and drilled this hole through it. And it's, um, it, 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 it beautifully landed right at that point at this image. And actually, um, I talk about this quite a bit, but I think in the old days, way back in Ebb and stuff like that, I was very analytically conscious about trying to define everything and you know, be able to um, you know, speak about everything in a very clear way. And I, I do that far, far less now. And very often I haven't a clue what I'm doing. And this was a definitely a, a, a case of that. And I tried to get other people to drill the hole, book binders, laser cutters. Nobody could do it or would do it. There's a certain amount of resistance to drilling the hole in the Bible. But what happened is actually, in the end, I managed to do it myself with the Black and Decker drill. And it, it's quite perfect. But this Bible is, is full of very, a real mixture of really tacky, colored kind of um, Moses in the bushes up to these very beautiful engravings. And this is the two Marys of the sepulcher. And the hole just landed at their hearts. And at the time, I had it open there. I, and, you know, I'm always finding academic friends are so wonderful about confirming things. But it is the point where Jesus is in the tomb and the Mary's all his kind of groupies who are in love with him are hanging around. And he's gone. He's gone up into the clouds. He's gone forever. And from that point on, you know, word, flesh, no more body. And it's something that's so enforced in Catholicism that is tragic. Um, and they're tragic also. But um, I, I felt by putting the hole back in there, it's, it, it's to totally become physical. Because it's quite pleasurable sticking your finger in it, too. It's very, very smooth. And you, it doesn't really destroy the Bible. You'll miss a few line, bits of lines, but you can make sense of it, you know? So, you know, some people do think it's real, um, what's the word? But, um, kind of destruction of something important. But, no, it's just a close-up. The wrong way around, actually, sorry. This place, again, I must run a bit faster here. Um, uh, halfway, after four years in the powerhouse, um, this ma a few of us artists were trying to manage to wheedle some deal to get a building in Dublin, you know, one of these <coughs> mad plans to try and get European money and stop working in derelict places. And, um, we met a, a developer who um, had lots of money and uh, lots of property, and we were going to try and get him to fund us. It never happened in the end, but he did, at, at dinner he got quite drunk and he said, I have this amazing glass house which is suspended over a river in County Wicklow, and would you like to work there? So I said I'd love to, and when rushing down and uh, it's actually amazing architecturally it's it's, it's cantilevered and it's, it's just on the, the leg is there the two legs so two third or three three fifths of it hang out over the river and it's a, a river called the Dargo in County Wicklow which in Victorian times was very popular for ladies going doing watercolors and things and when you're in it you, you just it's, it's incredible the water just rushes underneath so from the powerhouse I ended up in this kind of privileged place it was built by this entrepreneur called Basil Goulding, which was a, he was kind of head of the Bank of Ireland. Uh, that's probably not a great slide with reflection. Um, but Basil built it as a little kind of a bijou thing on his property to entertain his banker friends. But even way back then, commissioned people you know, in Ireland like James Coleman when he was younger to do pieces there. He was an amazing man who I never met. But as I moved in, the place got more and more bombarded with stones and uh, vandals came and broke the whole thing to smithereens. And I've just moved out of it because the man wants to do it up. And it was a deal where you know, you, he could throw me out in 24 hours, but it was very beautiful. I was there for um, three years, I think. And I, at, at the time, um, I think the Bible, the Bible piece actually happened there. That was a transition. And um, uh, I hadn't, now where did this, the snake, 
Yeah, the snakes, I ordered some snakes years and years and years ago from uh, the same Car Carolina, Carolina biological suppliers. So I had this feeling that I wanted to kind of reinvest the snake with some kind of importance because it had been kind of abused in the Bible. And I suppose I started looking at the Bible because it was in the studio and kind of looking at the stories again. So I went out and got some snakes from Carolina and I started hanging them off the trees in the, in the, in the garden. And the garden is it's, it's kept by a gardener. It's a stunningly beautiful wood, woodland garden. So it was like being in the Garden of Eden. It was mad. You know, you go down there to work and there were squirrels outside on the trees. It was so beautiful and so different to anywhere where else I've worked. But when I was gutting them, I found their hearts, obviously, because um, they were pickled and preserved, and it was just a gutting process where I was going to stuff them and dry them, because I wanted them to look kind of pathetic and desiccated. But this is one of their hearts, which is just like a little kidney bean. And um, I, I just actually was so touched by their finding their hearts, and it just it totally made me more and more see how I was, you know, as much to blame for the, the kind of mis strewed, you know, kind of reputation of the poor old snakes. And so I made this piece directly from that. And these are cottonmouth snakes, and they're just twisted around each other. And I made little reliquaries for their hearts. Uh, so you can actually open those little hearts and little screws on them. The jewelry training came in handy for that. And the little dried hearts lie inside. So this piece, which actually isn't in the Fritz Street show, uh, did kind of, in some ways, um, work more of the, the sweetness into them. Uh, because the hanging, uh, hangi, which I will show you in a minute, is a real abomination. This is a piece called Convention, which um, is just 12 little garter snakes and 12 speech bubbles, where they're, they look like they've met to convene at you know, some meeting and have a discussion, but th they're kind of voiceless, taken from above on a concrete floor. And that's close up. And this was one manifestation of, of this hanging. And I actually think the way it is now in Fritz Street is much, much more successful and, and beautiful. But this piece was made not to be beautiful. It's a bit like the Parthenon, awkward, fake structure. Um, but this is an Arlfini, which is one of the most difficult floors of any space I've ever worked in. It's kind of squeaky, waxy, brown parquet. And I built this wooden gallows, and then th there's one large snake, and the others look like they're actually, you're not too sure whether they're, you know, being banished to their own death or they're just creeping up there on their own to kind of commit suicide. But in, in Fifth Street, what we've done is use the beautiful old 17th century room as you enter as the arena for the same act. And I think it works probably a lot better. Um, this piece is very simple. It was just a pair of rings cast in bronze with human impressions, which I, uh, is, you know, is just kind of effort and kind of, well, it's kind of pathetic effort. And the, the, these two works are, um, they're kind of one work really, but this is a little crucifix that I found on the floor in one of the lockers in the power station. And it's actually o only about six inches tall and the Jesus was gone. And, but whoever had owned it beforehand had painted around Jesus loads and loads of times, so it's got beautiful little layers of kind of yellow and blue and black. And um, I did this photograph of it just for the absence, again, you know, back into the holes everywhere, all that absence. Um, but it, m m I feel much more beautiful in the absence. And then this is cr very crudely presented here again, but it, it's a, a fast taken photograph mimicking the Mantegna, famous, beautiful Mantegna painting of the deposed Christ with the, the women crying on either side. And I, I wanted it to be kind of a straightforward, fast photograph uh, where it was obviously a woman and it was obviously a mimicry. And it looked like possibly she was dead, you weren't too sure. And also showed the fakery of the Mantegna, which foreshortened the body um, uh, so much, and, but actually made it incredible. But also the Mantegna, what's so beautiful about it is that shroud over his penis, which is incredibly sexual. Here the, the black shadow is kind of like a void, and um, what you get when you see the two pictures next to each other is that you get the same, more or less the same shape on two images. Oh God, I better go faster. Um, this piece is called Close Your Eyes and Open Your Mouth and See What God Will Give You, which is an expression that I, I grew up with a lot. It was used very commonly with children in Ireland. And it was about trust. And you did it, and you hoped you got a sweet, and 
you hated it if you got something really nasty. So I went around friends of mine in Dublin and asked them to ask their children to do this. And what we ended up with was a freeze of kids' heads, oversized, above body height, where they're all doing this. And you get this absolute mixture of um, kind of fury and passivity and kind of sexuality. But in the end of the day, absolute kind of trust. Some looking like angels and some looking furious, like this guy. And I didn't in any way, I told them the expression, the new generation, about half of them knew it and about half of them didn't. Um, but they all were on for it. Um, I'm jumping a bit too quickly here too again. But uh, the, the Arnold Feeney show, which was called Even, w w w which was kind of adverbially about, about the notion of even, as, as uh, comparatively speaking, um, it, it's very, it, it was quite a mixture of things, and I was quite anxious about that in the beginning, but now I actually quite like that, because they, you could boil them all down and actually talk about them in similar ways, each piece, even though they're quite different physically or um, use of material and stuff. Th these are a series of photographs I did, taken from actually, this was the first one I found, which was um, a rugby match uh, in Ireland, and they, it was so like a Caravaggio that... It, I went and phoned up the Irish Times and they let me into their files and I went in with a macro lens and photographed into the photographs of these photographers around the ball, very much around the ball, it's just hands and ball. And they're so tender and sweet and loving. And, um, uh, you know, like this is such kind of adulation, it's incredible, his, his profile there you can see on the top. One, th one, one thing that I felt very strongly about in this particular piece, it could have been a whole different piece, it could have been very much about homoeroticism because Jesus is rampant in rugby matches, and the, the, gra the grabbing of crotches, and even the use of language in, in the rugby magazines, you should just for a treat buy a few rugby magazines, it is unbelievable. They say things like, in the black bowel of the scrum, you know? That's how they start their paragraphs. But anyway, I, I, I was trying to kind of lock into tenderness. Again, which this, and uh, this I suppose goes back into the powerhouse stuff and everything, uh, you know, to try and accentuate aspects in the territory like rugby that are never accentuated. But funny enough, um, so when I was in the middle of doing this, you know the way you're, you're very often working in art in the old collective unconscious or whatever and you see other things that are happening, the French rugby team who see themselves much more as sex um, symbols, uh, they're, they're all posed for photographs in the most amazing ways. They, they had this TV uh, promotion for the French rugby team and they played, um, I think it was from Lacme, this operatic music with all these beautiful men kind of diving around holding balls. And, um, but it was, it was still the rest of the body and not just the hands. So how we try, I, I printed them up. Originally I thought really, really big with the ball actual size, but then reduced them down and surrounded them with black. Probably not a great slide, so don't worry about focusing. So that they, the, the, the ball in every single image was the size of an egg. That was kind of the other, other option from the full size. This was a piece that I did in Belgium last year where we were invited to make a piece of work on, the, on a train, all women, which um, upset me greatly, but I, 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 I loved so many of the other artists on, on the project that we decided to do it. It ended up being kind of a bit of a fiasco. But the, um, this was my carriage, it was a baggage car, and when we were on our site visit, I found these beautiful concertina doors that are modern, that go between the carriages. So you go, eh, eh, you know, when you're walking through, they, they kind of flex in on, out, on each other. And my first impression, again, a bit like the pig being the first impression for the, the jail, was kissing, like on a train, and, you know, strangers on a train, Hitchcock, all those fabulous black and white films of people kissing and then running away or whatever. Um, so I built this tunnel that was 16 meters long out of six, 16 of the doorways, and beautifully, in true kind of meticulous um, Belgian fashion, they riveted them together and built a, a steel floor. And as you walked into it, halfway down, there's, um, again, uh, yeah, we're okay on the phone. There, there was a kiss cast from the two mouths of people kissing. And it was cast in silver and then gilded, and it was suspended at the eight meter point. So you came in one door and you could walk down and meet the kiss, or you came in the other door and the same thing. So you couldn't actually see both sides of the kiss. You had to walk down the other end of the tunnel. But I think the, the doors themselves were stunningly beautiful, and we actually, in the end, the um, Belgians managed to uh, well, get, um, get them to lend them to us because they all cost like 3,000 pounds each or something. That's getting closer. 
also the Belgians, uh, they were so funny, they wanted to do all these kind of high-tech machines with, with the kids revolving in plexiglass boxes and things. In the end, it, it was very hard to know how to put the kiss there, but I suspended it on just little silver wires. So it looked a little cobwebby and kind of basic, but um, I have no really great photographs of the kiss, but there are some in, uh, in Fritz Street. That you really have to look terribly, terribly close at them. Um, it's basically a dental plaster between, in each person's mouth, you find your position, you have to do it quite rapidly, and then extricating it is incredibly difficult because you have the palate in between the teeth and it's very, very fragile. And then you, again, equally, you have a really hard time trying to make a uh, rubber from it. But here, you, you see, what's wonderful is that in there, between the two tongues, is a, is a hole, and that's really where the kiss is. So it's, it's kind of like the death of a kiss, but, and the, the kiss is absent because the hole is the kiss where the most intimate pressure has happened as a whole. But they also read very much kind of like bones or um, kind of like weird metal flowers also. Then this is the last piece, so don't despair. Um, I went to Texas um, to do a residency last April in a pretty great place called Art Pace in San Antonio that's run by a very good woman called Linda Pace who inherited a lot of money from her father's hot sauce recipe called Pace Hot Sauce, and she's putting it into this great program where she, you get nominated and then they select, and uh, one foreigner, kind of international, one American and one Texan come for every three months to do a piece of work in their space. And this is an old um, converted garage, and you live there and you make your piece. And this piece is probably the most recent thing, and it actually is very much about death and nothing really in it to do with gender at all. But you, uh, Texas is incredibly hot, and this was a time of year where it was probably about 95, 96 degrees, and quite humid. So you, when you came into the space, we had left off the air conditioning, so it was very hot. And you encountered this big, kind of galvanized, kind of building thing. So it was like a little, I, I, I had hoped, like a little kind of a sanctuary mausoleum. And on the top was a little engine that whirred. And you walked over and opened the door, and you had to actually close the door behind you, because it's highly refrigerated inside. And that one fat, is in like fridges in Texas, it's, it's just, uh, it's, they're, they're the most amazing fridges, because they have to have them. But at the time, you know, I had been getting my snake specimens from scientific suppliers. And when I arrived in Texas, Linda said, oh, you must come to the snake farm. And I went out to this weird, funky place on the side of a highway that had said snake farm. And the man who runs it, he's quite young, and he's, he, he, I said to him, what do you do with the snakes when they die? And he said, you know, come round the back lady, and he opened this freezer and two fridges, regular domestic fridges that were bulging full of snakes. And um, he, he loved it. He kept them for, you know, ba mainly for taxidermists who would buy them for a few dollars. But he, he rented them to me for five dollars each, and I, he allowed me to take all his beautiful specimens. And like that's a, uh, an albino rattler on the top, very, very beautiful, natural rattler. Uh, this old man told me that very rare, but they are found in the wild. And then some of them were scientifically engineered rattlers, uh, oh sorry, not rattlers, but albinos, this one's an albino here, very buttery yellow. But um, well, basically what I was trying to do was create this kind of little um, like church-like uh, environment where these snakes were frozen. So you weren't too sure whether they were going to come alive again or whether they were gone forever. But certainly they were being preserved in a way just by the way they were placed. And also some look much more alive than others. And in Texas there's this obsession with cryogenics and religion and um, uh, lots of people are now signing on for their bodies to be put in liquid nitrogen when they die so that in the 21st century they hope they, through nanotechnology they can be reconstructed. But the only thing that they're afraid of even still is that memory will never be able to be reconstructed but it's getting more and more popular by the day. Um, but this was like a cryogenic chamber for the snake. And some of them were just so beautiful. And the, it, was, it was a refrigerator that didn't increase the frost, so they stayed the way they were without building up whiteness. That's the uh, rattler. And I asked him, I said, do you place them so beautifully? When they die, do you, do you twist them into these shapes and put them in there? And he said, generally, he'll put them in the way they die. But sometimes to make them smaller, he'll twist them. But it, just, it was amazing that they ended up so kind of beautifully um, positioned. This piece, that, this is a, a painting. Um, mm -hmm that um, is in the National Gallery in, in Ireland called 
the opening of the Sixth Seal by Francis Danby. And that was the only thing I brought with me to Texas. I kind of went with no plan of what I was going to do. But it's, I think it's a wonderful apocalyptic painting. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it, there, there's so much Bible bashing and, and religious stuff down there that I kind of felt it might work its way in. So what we did was had it printed. And this is a nutty slide, but it gives you an idea. The space was very, very dark. All these slides are showing you much brighter than it actually was. But we printed it up 8 foot by 12 foot, the same image, and had these kind of epileptic fans behind it, blowing it. So you had this kind of mad frenzy of, of uh, apocalypse. And below it, Linda very nicely allowed me to dig a hole 6 feet deep, about you know, 2 foot in diameter, which was like this kind of vertical grave. And we just lumped the stone below the thing. So that, in some ways, it was my favorite thing in the room, actually, the hole. I love the hole. And then the last piece as you came around was this brand new fire walker's outfit. Um, and you can, you can put it on, you can walk through flames. And, it, and it, they're beautiful. And the, 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 it's green plastic. They cost quite a lot of money. The, the green plastic has actually got full leaf on it. So when somebody's inside it, all you see is this gold thing. It's very kind of sci-fi. And that just sat on the ground on the other side. And that really, in some ways, was about, I suppose, like, you know, having your little outfit ready, you know, for the potential disaster. Whether that's something apocalyptic or whether it's something like dying in your sleep when you're 80, you know, it's, um, that's, uh, you know, basically what it was about. So th that's where the, the work has kind of um, stopped. And I think that's the last slide, no? Let's see. So if anyone... Um, has any questions or anything? Death. They don't want to talk about dead babies. Which is, I actually, the site I chose them. Uh, I see, I think these public spaces don't know why they're asking you. They have no notion why they're asking for art. And then they discover, <coughs> you know, we can't handle it. So all the works that were, were accepted were celebratory. But I, I knew, you know, I'm sure if you're having a baby, it's not very nice if you think you're, it's going to be dead. But that's not particularly what it's about, you see. But that's how people... Yeah. Mm. I was going to also put it in the basement so that people need only go and see it if they wanted to. But no, it was that, it was that paranoia. But you know, anything you do in, in public spaces, people are paranoid. Mm. But it's funny, you know, that one... You know, a friend of mine who works in fallopian tubes <laughs> wrote to me the other day and said that he wants a copy of it because he deals with people who can't have babies all the time. And he wants to show it to them because he thinks they're so obsessed that it actually kills the baby. Because you know these stories that, you know, very often then they get fertility stuff and then they get pregnant regular, uh, in a regular way later on. But it's funny that he locked straight into that because it's not particularly about that. It's about the... N it's, it's about one's... It's about I used it in, in New York very much about how we all inherit mortality the minute we're born. That's our first inheritance before we get the bricks, the bath, anything else. Wh what we get from our parents is our own mortality. And that conflict runs through everything. And it's something that really interests me and upsets me, obviously, but um, uh, is, tr is, is, my, is my truth, you know? And uh, very difficult. Um, well, I don't think people know whether you can't actually a live baby. Uh, it's, it's, you can't, physically you can't um, because you'd injure the baby um, and you can't x-ray through a pregnant woman's uh, body either but you see I hope with that that you don't know you don't know whether it's actually like why is it in the head or, you know has it come from a, a, is it alive or is it dead and uh, maybe I gave the game away by saying it was dead or anything. but when you see the skeleton you, you see the mortality I, I suppose that's where I'm talking about the mortality I had never seen the skeleton of a baby before um, or an x-ray of a baby and I was amazed at how the, the joints disconnect. It's like a little doll. And it's, it's so kind of sweet. And, 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 but it's still an exact replica of, of us, you know? Um, yeah, so I suppose I did... You know, so is it an imagined? Is this about, you know, um, thought? It, it might be about a baby. Uh-huh. Really? Yeah. yeah. 
But isn't, 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 that, isn't that about a certain death of the brain, if it takes over the brain? You know, um, it, it obliterates it, it, if it's an obsession. You know, you could, you could talk about it in, in, that, in that sense as well. You see, I'm aware that things like that piece and the cow piece, in, in fact, all the pieces, um, people come to with their own stuff. And I even he, stand in here talking about it, that's why I was saying in the beginning, you know, questions are great because it does then make you talk about them. And I suppose I probably end up talking about them in the most familiar way for me. Or maybe if I did this tomorrow night, I would talk about them differently, you know? Um, but it does interest me in, in people's responses to them, like my friend who, who taught about obsessive parents without child, children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, some people say that more than others. I've heard from other mothers that they haven't experienced that so much, but Marina Warner talks about that a lot in, in her book, too. And it's, re it's, it's interesting me not having a baby to hear these stories because also it's about, it's not only about a woman's experience or it's not only about a woman who's had a baby. I made it, I haven't had a baby. It could be a male skull in terms of procreation, you know, the male role within the engendering of the child, you know. It is n absolutely not specifically female, you know, I hope. But of course, like, I'm female, you're female, you know, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> Didn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of wanted it to be kind of iconic, iconic and portrait-like too, in terms of kind of authority. Even in the scale it's presented, it's not just an X-ray. I printed it on black and white paper and made it something that isn't to be found in the hospital. So I kind of wanted to shift it a little bit away from that territory as well. You know. And the model is usual too, though, kind of, the model. Because I, I feel I'm in the model all the time. Um, and it's okay, but one is told all the time that a model isn't okay. All the time. It's so boring, we have been told that being in the model isn't okay. You know? And that's what's so constraining in life, you know, that you're given these patterns and pathways, you know, that supposedly tell you you won't be in a model if you go down them, you know. So, um, <laughs> some of the time I like models. It's the most enjoyable though, isn't it? That, 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 that when you can make it yourself, I, I just find it totally enjoyable. I so much prefer it. Mm -hmm. But I th people do refer to the telephone artists of the new generation, don't they? Or I call them telephone artists anyway. And I've been one once or twice. Even buying the brand new fire outfit, I felt terribly kind of guilty that I was putting this beautiful thing on the floor that I had nothing to do with except that I bought it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you? <laughs> no, uh, I suppose. Um, <laughs> no, I suppose I'm talking of my generation, you know, which is uh, I, I refer to as middle age recently. Um, I'm talking about, yeah, I'm, you know, uh, yeah, I, I suppose that was a bit of a uh, slip-in, throwaway. Um, the generation who actually don't manufacture at all, who do pick the telephone up and order. Um, it, it's um, sometimes it can work. It can, but generally speaking, it's just too easy, you know. There's, a, there's no mud there, there's no struggle there, you know.
Why? <laughs> I can understand why. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I shut up. The problem Richard Tucker and I have with speaking English or <laughs> No, never. <laughs> Do you think then the English should be more like the Irish? <laughs> but it, it, yeah. it's a, I do and I, I do and I don't. It's like, uh, you know, part of me resists the Irish label. I can't, you know, being in Ireland, it, it's so awful the way we manufacture our own labels. That are then, you know, the whole Paddy syndrome that we actually make it up and then England uses it and everywhere else uses it. And I always edit out as much as I can the Irishness. But I'm. Yeah. I hope so. You know, I'll be, you know, I suppose I was being disparaging about international artists and I wasn't clear about who I was referring to. But, um, you know, yes. I think because Ireland suffers so much from its identity. You know, England does too in a different way. But we do, we do differently, I think. And again, this is a whole, uh, you know, can of worms and everything. But um, England, we, had, we have no tradition visually. So I'm always saying this back in Ireland, is that uh, there's no, very little respect for the visual. You see, you have such a heritage. You have all those museums and collections from wherever it's from, whether it's from, you know, some other colony or what. Uh, and then you go into all your, your, <laughs> your painting tradition. We didn't have any of that, so, and there's no actual value attached to it, but I think essentially there's a very ancient value, very ancient, unconscious connection with the visual. So you get this kind of funny, strange, kind of healthy disrespect, which at times when you're feeling a bit low, you think, fuck this country, drive me mad, there's absolutely no respect for visual artists. Like words, you get onto an airplane, you're reading James Joyce on the, on the, on the fabric in front of your nose, everywhere. Joyce Beckett Shaw, everybody. Um, but as a result, I think that kind of um, lack of respect, and I don't know whether you'd agree, Cathy, on it, is, is kind of, I, I feel, quite makes it a nice situation to be in because um, you're not making, actually, for any authority within your own country. So I probably would play the authority of art form or whatever else as much as anybody here. I don't know. Or do I? I don't know. You know, of course, one likes to think one doesn't, but, um, you know, I would love to think one doesn't at all, that you, can, you do it in a shoebox and never show it to anyone and it would still be the same work. But that's the scary thing when you start to kind of see the mighty thing, you know, that you are acting to the fashions and all the rest of it. But um, I don't know, am, am I answering anything? But I think it actually it's probably harder to be English than Irish. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But it's funny now because a lot of English artists probably have, your, you know, the younger ones anywhere, the Brit pack thing. I don't know if any of you are here, but um, probably not. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's an awful thing to have to kind of function within, I would imagine.
Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, you don't. Yeah, I don't know how people work in New York and, and, and even London, and, and I'm not so familiar with it here, but just the pressure of everybody watching everybody else coming out of your door in Soho in, in New York or whatever and just seeing all these things going on. It must be incredibly difficult to, to um, find the space in your head to, to do something. Yeah. I know. Mind you, they look terribly glamorous. You should try them for five minutes. Freezing and filthy, and although the glass house wasn't freezing, I had heating for two years there. But then the kids were breaking the window. So, um, yeah, but they are—they are glamorous on side. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm, and they're never—they're never permanent because I never know when I'm going to be thrown out. Too, so you never have any time to feel that you're secure. Which sometimes I think has got to be lovely, you know, but. Um, I've never had it, so yeah, I don't know what that's like. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen next. I keep moving, yeah. I know, despite my need to have a little nest somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> you come and live in London? Uh, well, I was here for um, how many? one year after studying in Leicester but just making jewellery. I used to sell Pieros to Liberty. I sold them for something like 15 pounds, and I think they sell them for 50. <laughs> that was my... Okay. Okay. Um,